Good morning, HIC. Why don't we all rise and praise our God together? the Lord our maker there is no equal to the king of kings oh our God is with us we will fear no evil cause you do impossible things yeah you do impossible things though I walk though I walk through the Darkness surrounding me. There you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. There is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Oh, our God is with us. We will fear no evil. Cause you do impossible there is no healer there is no healer like the lord our maker there is no equal to the king of kings oh our god is with us we will fear no evil because you do impossible things yeah you do impossible one word and the walls start falling one word and the blind will see one word and the sinners forgiven because you do impossible one word one word and the walls start falling one word and the blind will see one word and the sin is forgiven Cause you do impossible things There is no healer like the Lord our maker There is no equal to the King of kings Oh, our God is with us, we will fear no evil Cause you do impossible There is no healer there is no healer like the Lord our maker There is no equal to the King of kings Oh, our God is with us, we will fear no evil Cause you do impossible things, yeah You do Let's sing one more time, one word One word and the walls start falling one word and the blind will see One word and the sin is forgiven Cause you do impossible things One word One word and the walls start falling One word and the blind will see One word and the sin is forgiven Cause you do impossible things Let's give a hand clap to our God for those impossible things
Lamb of God, holy and righteous, blessed Redeemer, bright morning star, oh the
Jesus, I love you, I will sing, I will sing forever, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you.
Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and away from the river's mercy. 
mercy stream of the Savior's love for me. I will rise, I will rise from waters deep into the saving arms of God. I will sing salvation songs, Jesus Christ has said. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday that we can spend together as the body of Christ. Thank you, God, so much for all the blessings that you have given us through all this vacation time. And we know we are preparing our hearts as students, as professors, as staff to start a new semester, God. But we don't want to forget your calling in our hearts, God, why we're here, why you have brought us from different parts of the world. God, I pray that uh, you give us your mercy, your grace. Every day we can grow more and more in your knowledge, God. We want to pray uh, especially for our pastor, Pastor Greg, who is returning from his trip. Thank you that you gave him this opportunity to spend time in his uh, home uh, and with his family, God. We pray that he comes back safely and smoothly without any issues. Also, God, I want to pray for uh, our team in Madagascar. I pray, God, that you give them the grace to go on, God, despite uh, the opposition, despite the spiritual warfare. God, we pray that your grace abounds more and more, God, and that they are filled of your presence, filled of your Holy Spirit to speak powerfully through you, God. You have sent them, and you, ha you are walking in front of them, God. I pray that you protect them, uh, protect, encourage them, God, and that they may return safely, God. We pray for Fensu and Joanna, who are there, God, and I pray that you give them the grace to continue, and thank you so much that you gave the opportunity for HIC to send this beautiful team. God, we also want to pray for our ministries that we are starting recruiting, God, we pray that you call those uh, to service that have the heart and are, are want to serve the church, God. We pray that you wake uh, the spirits that are asleep, God. We pray that you uh, ra rise faithful servants, God, to serve you wholeheartedly, God, uh, as we recruit for EPT, for CM, for YM, for ushers. God, I pray that you give us the grace as a church to love one another with the same love that Jesus Christ has loved us, God. Thank you so much for this opportunity to serve. And also, I want to pray especially for uh, Professor Scott Lincoln, who will be praying the, uh, preaching the word today, God, that you give him uh, your Holy Spirit, God, um, you promise that the words that you give will not return to you empty, but they will fulfill the purpose that you have sent them to do, God. And we pray that we receive this word in our hearts and it bears a lot of fruit and we can share and uh, lay our, all our burdens down to your feet, God, because you carry them on the cross for us. Thank you so much, God, for your sacrifice. Thank you for this beautiful day. We pray that we have a beautiful day in you and that you give us more and more of your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you, Danny and music team. Welcome to Handong International Congregation. It's good to see a nice group here. I was kind of wondering with the holiday here and people traveling and going back to their hometowns and things, uh, how it would be, but it's nice to see everyone here. Again, welcome. And uh, uh, if you would please stand up just for a moment and maybe greet the people around you, say hello or good morning or, or whatever you want to say. That, I feel kind of left out because nobody greeted me, but good job. Um, again, welcome. Uh, if you are here as a visitor or maybe uh, for the first time or the first time in a long time, uh, we'd like to ask you to fill out the HIC visitor information form. There's a form in the back um, that you can get from the table or scan the QR code. We just want to get to know you a little bit better and and uh, be able to welcome you fully. So thank you for coming visitors. Uh, second announcement is this. We have uh, an HIC life group which will meet shortly after the service ends. We call it a connect group, English connect. And we meet in room 108 downstairs on the first floor of this same building. And essentially it's more of a discussion oriented group where we we, we share prayer requests, but we also ask questions and share thoughts and ideas about the message that we've heard today. So if you're not in a hurry, you're welcome to join the Connect group at 1030 or so down in room 108 right after the service. We have a, uh, believe it or not, it's coming soon, a new semester starting. Yes. And as always, HIC is recruiting for youth ministry and children's ministry teachers and helpers. Youth ministry would be, I don't know the age range, but older kids, uh, they meet together after the service and um, the children's ministry meets during the service, but it seems that there's always a need for people or stu students or people who have a heart to serve and to especially work with kids. So please uh, keep that in mind, and I'm sure we'll get more announcements about that coming next week and very soon. Um, starting next week, as Danny mentioned in her prayer, Pastor Greg and Tara and the Browns will be back sometime this week. So we'll be meeting next week in the big Hyom Chapel, not in this room. So if you show up here next week, Sunday morning and you think what's going on then right away think oh yeah I need to go over to the big chapel so we'll be at the big chapel with PG back starting next week um, you're able to give your tithes and offerings and your gifts two different ways we have our box in the back near where Danny and Grace are, are at and you're able to just drop them in the offering box if that's what you prefer to do. Uh, but you can also give online. And there's information on our bulletin. Or if you're watching online, you can, you can find information about how to, how to give your tithes and offerings. Finally, I want to mention a couple of things regarding to missions. As Danny prayed, our Madagascar missions team seems to be doing very well and having a great time and much opportunity for service. Um, uh, a couple of things to just update you. Um, they will be leaving Madagascar on Tuesday. So uh, they will then come back, and it's quite a long trip back. They'll be back sometime on Thursday. Um, and as some of you may have followed uh, on Facebook, um, God is giving them a great time. They do have a few prayer requests. One would be health issues. Uh, they've mentioned two specific things. One would be some allergies, and I think that may be skin allergies in particular. I know Grace Artana from the Philippines tends to have issues with skin allergies. And the second one, which is to be expected, 
it didn't seem to be serious, but still it's an issue, would be um, um, digestive issues digest and food issues as they get used to new foods and new germs, so the kind of things to battle through. Uh, they also have mentioned that this is, I don't know whether it's full rainy season yet, but it's the part of the season there where it can rain off and on and sometimes rain a lot. And apparently a few days ago they had a really big rain, which is probably especially hard on the local people, but it, made, it makes ministry and traveling, some of the roads get washed out and things like that more difficult. So they mentioned that as a, as a prayer issue. And I want to turn on my phone and just read the most recent message from the team. It's labeled prayer requests. Uh, and they're talking about the service, their Sunday service. They'll have a morning service with uh, the youth at 8.30. And then the main service at 10 with lunch and fellowship. They'll do Monday morning ministry and then Monday afternoon, shopping and packing up and getting ready to return. And again, on Tuesday afternoon, they'll return and appreciate prayer for their safety and grace for returning because it's, I think, a 36-hour trip back with a couple of layovers. So they are, yes, they're on an adventure. So if we could, let's take just a moment and pray together for our Madagascar team. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of HIC being able to sponsor and send this team. And I know that when we considered the idea, it was very late in the semester, and it seemed like it was really probably too late to do it. But you've proven yourself faithful through the generous gifts of our HIC members and others. Uh, you provided the funds needed to send the team. You raised up a team of young people eager to go and thank you that uh, HGU graduates Fensu and Joanna were eager to have a team come and, and to receive a team. And thank you that you've given them so many opportunities to serve and to demonstrate the love of Christ to people who need to see Jesus and need to know Jesus. So we pray for a glorious day today for them and finishing up grace, good health, and safe travel back. And as they come back, may we be eager to hear uh, the mission report that they'll have for us. We pray most of all, Lord Jesus, that you will be glorified uh, through this team and through this opportunity, and that HIC in the future will continue to be able, as you enable us, to be generous in supporting missions and missionaries and in sending teams. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we do have one more announcement, and our focus on missions this week would be the Talbot family, Pat and Kathy Talbot. Some of you uh, remember them well. I see uh, Tim North would know them very well, and some of us people that have been around a while. Uh, Pat uh, was a professor at Hills at the law school here, and uh, the Talbot family, they were active in HIC. Uh, for a number of years, they've been in the US now with a focus on providing resources and help for Christian legal advocacy, especially in Asia, especially in developing countries and in countries where sometimes Christians uh, uh, are persecuted or not afforded justice in a way that they should be. So um, that is the heart of their current mission. Um, I believe we have some specific prayer requests for them, and they're mentioned on the bulletin and perhaps on the screen as well. So I, I won't read these word for word, but just to highlight, they have done quite a lot with videos and providing video lectures and information regarding to biblical worldview. Um, they're asking also that their online library will be an effective tool in impacting and helping students and advocates, especially Christian advocates globally. And some of you remember their daughter, Gloria. She uh, has just returned to the U.S. from Lebanon. 
she and her husband were there with two small children, and they had a bit of a difficult time just getting out in light of the recent uh, outbreak of trouble in the Middle East. But they are, they are in the U.S. now, and, and uh, Pat and Kathy are asking for prayer for them to adjust to what God has for them next. So let's take just a moment, please, and we'll pray together for the Talbots. Thank you, God, for Pat and Kathy Talbot and their family. And thank you for um, just their faithful service to you, the desire they have to use their skills and talents and training to build up the body of Christ, their heart for Christians in difficult situations for persecuted Christians. And I pray that you continue to give them grace through their online material and in various ways to help equip young Christian lawyers in many countries to represent Christ and to represent Christians in need of legal help. We pray for much fruitful ministry for them. We also pray for Gloria and Jonathan and the, the little ones, and we're thankful that they were able to remain safe and to, uh, to, to leave a dangerous situation. Please give them grace as they settle into the U.S. Uh, for however long or however short that may be, uh, and that they will be uh, just know your provision and your blessing and your protection. Thank you for the Talbots and the other missionaries that you give us the grace to support. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe it's time to welcome our speaker this morning, and that's Professor Lincoln. Thank you. Please give him a, an applause as he comes up. No scripture reading. Oh. Sorry, no scripture reading. We need a scripture reading. I knew I was forgetting something. I'm so sorry, Anna. Mark chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is the word of God. Okay. So, Happy New Year. Say hey, Bokmani Padaseo. Right. So, this is a pretty large crowd. I thought I got. I thought I got lucky with you know for the with the holidays. You know, speaking, I thought there wouldn't be very many people, but it's good to see a lot of people out. Um, so today, what I want to talk about, I've hijacked this verse a little bit. It's. It's. I'm going to be taking it a little out of context, right? Because where does this verse come from? What's the story? It's the rich young man. Right? So the rich young man comes and he says, hey, I've kept all the, the scriptures, and, you know, but Jesus says, well, that's not enough. Right? So, and then the, the disciples question him. Wow, even this rich young guy can't get into heaven? It's not, you know, and, he's, and that's when Jesus said, looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. But what I really want to talk about is miracles. So... Um, because miracles are a very important part of our faith, right? They're the evidence. When, like Frank Turek or, you know, other people, they say, why should we believe what Jesus said? And he says, well, because he came back from the dead. He predicted a lot of things, and then he, you know, was killed and, and returned from the dead. So if you could do the same, I'd listen to you, <laughs> right? So the idea that... Um, and when even John the Baptist, right, when he was wondering, he sent his disciples when he was in prison, and he went, uh, he, he went, he had them go and ask, are you the one or is there someone else to come? And so in um, Matthew 11.5, it said, you know, the, what did Jesus say? He, he told the disciples, you know, report back to John, what are you seeing, right? So what did you see with your own eyes? He said, the blind are made to see. Those who could not walk are walking. Those who have had bad skin diseases are healed. Those who could not hear are hearing. The dead are raised up to life, and the good news is preached to poor people. 
So even Jesus was basically pointing to the miraculous things that he was doing as evidence of who he was and his identity, and that we should believe in him and have faith in what he said about other things because of the, the miracles that he was able to perform, right? So that's a very important part of our faith and what it is and, and why we come to faith. Um, but for the scientific brain, okay, so I came up, my undergraduate was in physics, and when I was an undergraduate, I was a full-on atheist, which is basically taught to you as a scientist in most programs that, you know, to be skeptical of everything, okay, and big claims especially, you want to be skeptical about big claims. So a lot of scientists in particular struggle, okay, with the idea of miracles, okay, that these are impossible things, right? These can't happen. So um, what serves as a proof to us of who Jesus was and why we should believe him Someone with a scientific training a lot of times is taught a materialistic worldview, and they're taught to reject these kinds of things out of hand, right? So it's very hard for scientists to come to believing faith a lot of times. So even if you're not a scientist, <laughs> okay, I hope to um, inspire you to evangelize scientists because this is kind of how I came to Christ, was I had to be convinced, okay, in a kind of scientific ways. Are miracles really possible? Is this kind of thing something that I can really believe in? So, and I know that that's uh, echoed through a lot of the scientific, you know, community. So even if you have no problem with miracles and, you know, then, but we can talk about special revelation, the word of God and the scriptures, but if you're trying to evangelize using only special revelation, scientists are going to turn a blind or turn a deaf ear to you, right? Because you can say, oh, the four spiritual laws and the Romans road and all these ways of evangelizing people who don't know. But if somebody says, I don't believe in the Bible, I believe in science, okay, then how do you approach them? Okay, you have to speak to them using their language, right? We have to be prepared to give reasons for the faith we have. And we have to be able to try and convince people. So that's the tact I'm going to take. I'm going to focus on natural revelation. <laughs> okay. So um, next slide. So David Hume, okay, very famously um, started this kind of think way of thinking, okay, where he says, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And as a firm and unalterable experience, has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. So that's a little archaic language, but basically he's saying that we know the laws of science. We have observed them continuously. We know what they are. Miracles violate these laws. So because miracles are a violation of the physical laws that we know and we have seen continuously, we can reject them completely. Okay, they can completely be rejected. So this is that scientific approach to, you know, why re people reject miracles out of hand. Okay, so a more recent, a more recent uh, version is Richard Dawkins. Okay, he's a very famous atheist. Um, he espouses a lot of evolutionary worldview and tries to convince people that, you know, um, God isn't real. He wrote The God Delusion and other books like that. So he says, any belief in miracles is flat contradictory, not just to the facts of science, but to the spirit of science, right? Because, like I said, the scientific method is a very powerful method, okay? And um, it came from, like, Francis Bacon. And the idea is that we want to test what we see. We want to be skeptical about things. The scientific method is to always assume you're wrong, okay, and to try to prove yourself wrong. And if somebody says, oh, I think this is right, try to prove it wrong. 
And if you can't prove it wrong over and over again, you try to find different ways of proving it wrong, and you can't do it, then you start to have faith in some scientific fact, okay, that we, you know, are constantly trying to disprove it. Okay, but once we have things, you know, miracles and special revelation that happened a long time ago, these historical facts obviously can't be tested that way. So um, it's hard. But um, Francis Bacon, who's generally credited with being the, the father of modern science and the scientific method, there's a great quote by him. He says, a little science takes a man away from God. A lot of science brings him back. So I really like that quote, because I found that to be my experience too. Okay, when I started studying science, and if I had a you know, very shallow view of science, okay, then that can start to take you away from God as you start to say, well, this is what the physical laws say, and this is why I reject miracles, and that kind of thing. It can take you away. Um, but a lot of science brings you back once you start to really dig into what is the foundation of what we know. Okay, so. Uh, the next slide. This, in particular, Richard Dawkins has brought this up. Okay, does anybody know what these are? You might know the first one, right? So the first one's pretty easy. Okay, that's water, right? H2O. So the two white ones are oxygen molecules, and the, it looks like a Mickey Mouse hat, so somebody, some people say. Okay, so, um, so it's two hydrogens and one oxygen there. And then over here is ethyl alcohol. Okay, this is the, the structure of ethyl alcohol. So again, we have the oxygen and another hydrogen, and then so it's written usually as uh, C2H5OH. Okay, is the chemical formula for ethyl alcohol. Okay, so you can see we've got hydrogen and oxygen over there, okay, and more hydrogen and oxygen over here, but there's also carbon is introduced. So Richard Dawkins has said, Okay, how can you turn water into wine when water has just hydrogen and oxygen atoms in there? Okay, where's the carbon coming from, right? So to create carbon out of thin air, okay, would require some kind of nuclear fusion, which would create a lot of energy. It's not, obviously didn't happen. Okay, so we can obviously reject the idea that, you know, Jesus turned water into wine didn't happen, right? So um, that's one of the examples. So the next example, oh, okay. It was supposed to be an extra click, <laughs> okay. So I wanted you to guess who it was, but now they've kind of given it away. Okay, so it said, when I began to read the gospel according to John, I confronted the first time, uh, would walk to my faith. I th Oops, okay, this is, there's, there's some typos in here. Okay, a uh, block to my faith, I think. The first miracle performed by Jesus at the wedding at Cana in Galilee, which he and, invited, had, he and his disciples had been invited to, when the wine ran out, Jesus asked the servants to fill the jars with water, draw some out, and take it to the master of the banquet. The servants, servants did so according to Jesus' command. The result was quite astonishing to me. Water turned into wine. In an instant of time, the chemical equation was changed from H2O to C2H5OH, so far, no nuclear fusion occurred in that room. How can pure water turn into wine instantly? What a miraculous event that was. I told my wife that I would attend church, but I could not believe in the Bible. Okay, so that was from um, See the Invisible Change the World, his biography, basically. So President Kim, okay, Kim Jong-il, the founding president of Handong, okay, faced the same types of doubts when he first started to read the Bible. He you know, came across Jesus turning water into wine and went, ridiculous, not possible. Okay, this is not physically possible, right? Okay, so um, how can I possibly believe this? Well, obviously he managed to overcome that, okay, and I was able to overcome that, so I want to kind of lead you through a little bit of the thinking, okay, as to how this works. So um, we'll go on to the next. So one of the things that has been very important to a lot of scientists who have questioned the materialistic worldview is the idea of a first cause, okay, or an unmoved mover, okay, if you want to go back to the Greeks. 
So this idea has been around a very long time. And now the understanding of the idea of the, this is a picture of the Big Bang. Okay, what's generally referred to as the Big Bang Theory. Not the TV show, but the actual theory. So, um, and this is what we think we know about how the universe was created. So there's a lot of this that's uh, still not well understood. Like, for instance, the inflationary period in that beginning part. It's too small to see, but in the very beginning, you can see it goes very big, very fast, and then kind of gradually after that. So that very big, very fast, the inflationary period that's in there, had the universe expanding faster than the speed of light. So there's, people have theorized that gravity worked in reverse as a repulsive force during that period. Okay, no reasoning why that should be possible or even, you know, why that should be. But um, there's quite, about a, quite a few things about this that I want to illuminate that we don't understand very well. But one of the things I teach in the creation evolution class that I find is one of the strongest evidences is this argument called the Kalem cosmological argument. And it's just three things. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Okay. So now we understand the universe began to exist. Most scientists would agree, yes, the universe began to exist. Okay, which, that's an, a relatively recent thing. Okay, um, the steady state model of the universe, the steady state theory of the universe was the, the predominant scientific theory until the 20th century. Okay, it wasn't until 1965 when the steady state theory was really um, completely abandoned by the scientific community. Okay, so there are probably people in here today that can, or, you know, were alive when the steady state theory was still uh, the, the predominant scientific theory of, of the scientific community where they thought the universe always was and the universe was eternal and pretty much stayed the same. Okay, so that started to fall apart earlier in the 20th century and so but it had its last uh, kind of dying breath in 1965 when um, Penzias and Wilson discovered the microwave background radiation, which was basically the echo of the Big Bang, okay, that they were able to observe this microwave background radiation, which basically proved there was a Big Bang and there was a beginning. Okay, until that time, it was still controversial that theory, and a lot of people, the, the actual name Big Bang um, was originally brought up as a mockery. So Sir Fred Hoyle was a scientist, and he's like, what, so the universe started with some Big Bang? It was a sarcastic comment. <laughs> but everybody liked the idea and started calling it the Big Bang Theory, which bothered him to no end um, for, a while, for quite a while. So. But whatever begins to exist, whoop, back. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Hard to argue with, right? If something didn't exist and then it begins to exist, there must be some cause. So the universe began to exist, very widely accepted now. Um, therefore, the universe has a cause. Okay, so what is that cause? That's the big question. Right? Because when we talk about the Big Bang, we're not just saying stars and planets and things came, became to exist. The actual idea of the Big Bang Theory is that all energy and matter and space and time itself started at the Big Bang. So when people say, well, what happened before the Big Bang? That, does, that question doesn't even make sense to a physicist because there was no before. Before is a time concept. There was no time. So, um, so but it, it had a beginning, so what's the cause? 
Okay, how can we understand that? What could possibly cause something that when there is no matter, there is no energy, there is no time, there is no space? Okay, what could cause all of that to come into existence? So it's, it's a challenging thing for an atheist to come to grips with, right? What could it be? Because it can't be something material. It can't be something it, that exists in space or time. So whatever caused it has to be immaterial, very powerful. Okay, and there's, other, there's a good long list of other qualities that we can kind of bring out, like it has to be personal to make the decision to create. Okay, so, um, and when we talk about power, well, I don't, I don't want to get, uh, it's not in my notes, I'm gonna, yeah. It's too easy for me to get distracted and get off topic. So, um, it's on topic, but not enough time. Okay, so um, this itself has uh, been very challenging for atheists. So Robert Jastrow was a physicist who um, had a good quote about this. Oh, we can go to the next. Okay, so, because it's interesting that in Isaiah 45, 12, and, and there's about a dozen places in scripture where this term stretched out the heavens comes, uh, is used. It's used over and over again, the idea of stretching out the heavens, right? So from this picture, okay, so it says, I, it is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts, okay? Because the picture, that scientific picture of the Big Bang, I can see God stretching, <laughs> okay? Like I said, that inflationary period where the universe was expanding faster than the speed of light, which defies all uh, scientific understanding, okay? But it has a very close parallel to this verse about God stretching out the heavens. So, and this is something that did impress Robert Jastrow. He wrote a book next, okay, called God and the Astronomers in 1973. So after coming to grips with uh, the death of the steady state theory of the universe, that the universe had this beginning, and what does that actually mean? Okay, that was something that very obviously that when you had the universe being created, that implies a creator to him. Okay, so he, once he rejected the steady state theory of the universe, he felt challenged that he couldn't do anything but believe in a creator, although he's still, he was still very wishy-washy about who the creator was. But there was a great quote from that book, which I like. It says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a funny story, right? So he's, what he's saying is that you know, scientists have been studying for centuries and trying to figure out all this stuff, and they thought, oh, we know what's really true, and we know what's really going on, but then they had accepted this steady state theory of the universe for a long time, <laughs> and once they finally figured out, oh, what's the real nature of the universe? Well, it was created, and when you actually look at the idea of the Big Bang, okay, it goes right back to Genesis 1, <laughs> right? Okay, that um, somebody said that Genesis 1 reads quite a lot like the modern Big Bang theory, not in a scientific you know, way, of course, but that that um, parallels very closely the idea okay, that God created the universe. Okay? It wasn't there, right? It was just void, and then God created it all. Okay? That the modern understanding of the Big Bang theory matches that way more closely than the steady state theory that had been the scientific consensus until the early 20th century. Um, so it's, it's an interesting challenge for them, okay? Now, these days, we've had more modern scientists have tried to find a way around this, okay? So um, 
so the next slide shows a, a quote by, from Stephen Hawking. It's one of his, well, his most famous final, his final very famous quote, I guess. So it says, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Okay, so this is one of his famous last quotes before he passed away. Um, so they're trying to get around that idea. So that, remember, the Kalem cosmological argument that I brought up. Okay, that first line in that argument says that if something begins to exist, then it has a cause. Right? If something begins to exist, it has a cause. So they're trying to refute that first statement. Right? They're trying to say, well, the universe began to exist, but it can bring itself into existence. It doesn't need an external cause. Right? So that's a hard thing to argue with. Right? That if something begins to exist, it has a cause, most people would say, well, yeah, of course. Okay? If something didn't exist and now it exists, there must be some cause to that. That's pretty... Uh, obvious, but they don't like that argument, okay, that William Lane Craig and other people, but him in particular, have been throwing this in their face for a long time and they're getting upset, okay, that if something begins to exist, it has a cause, the universe began to exist, so, okay, the universe has a cause. So now they're trying to refute the first statement. So um, the next one, so Lawrence Krauss, you may not have heard of him, but um, he wrote a book, A Universe from Nothing. So, A Universe from Nothing. So his quote, if you have nothing in quantum mechanics, you always have something. So he's been going around doing the lecture circuits recently, um, telling everyone that the universe can create itself from nothing. So just like uh, Stephen Hawking, and um, Richard Dawkins was interviewed after reading his book and going to interview Krauss. So Richard Dawkins was in an interview and he was trying to quote Krauss in his book and um, got laughed at by the audience. He was in an, a studio audience and they were asking and he started trying to say about this that, you know, that yes, the universe can create itself from nothing, but it has to be a particular kind of nothing. <laughs> And everybody cracked up, and he's like, why is that funny? <laughs> he didn't understand why people thought that funny, okay, that you can have a particular kind of nothing, right? So, um, what Krauss talks about this all the time, is that there's these different types of nothing, okay, and most people find that kind of humorous. Um, so, the next part is a, is a short clip from a YouTube channel, it's on Discovery Science, they have a special playlist called Science Uprising, which I highly recommend. Uh, they're short clips, less than 10 minutes, okay, on different topics. Um, so there's a, about a minute or so clip, okay, here that I took out of this one that, that we're talking about them. Gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, when I first read that, I was staggered. John Lennox. Because it's self-contradictory to start with. Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe can create itself from nothing. That's a flat contradiction. And then to say the universe can create itself, that's logical nonsense. If I say that X creates Y, roughly speaking, I'm saying if you've got X, you, you may in the end get Y. But if I say X creates X, then that simply proves to me that nonsense remains nonsense even if high-powered scientists say it. Well, what about physicist Lawrence Krauss and his something from nothing idea? Imagine creating a universe from literally nothing. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Because how they get a universe from nothing is by redefining nothing. Krauss's nothing is actually something. A set of laws and mathematical equations. 
That's the first problem. Meyer explains the second problem. Krauss's nothing involves the equations of quantum physics. And equations are mathematical entities. And mathematical entities are abstract concepts, always exist in minds. So his nothing seems to imply the need for a pre-existing mind. A pre-existing mind. Now what does that sound like? The Big Bang provides very, very strong evidence pointing to God. Because it shows that everything started, all matter, time, space, and energy, at some point in the past, that means that something had to start it. And that something had to be immaterial, timeless, infinitely powerful, and even personal because only a personal being can choose to act with purpose. But some people will embrace almost any absurdity to avoid the possibility of God. You say there are three different types of nothing. That's right. What, I mean, what are the three? I didn't know, know there was such a variety. You, it, a sampler platter. You haven't been rubbing any of that baby shampoo <laughs> on your head, have you? <laughs> with the THC in it? Well, no? I'm, I'm uh, no You're comment. You're clean? No comment. You're clean? Yeah. Give me a hair sample. Three kinds of nothing or three kinds of nonsense. If people can convince you that our entire... So, that's why most people find that, that idea a bit absurd, um, that you can have something from nothing. But, uh, and John Lennox was the first person to refute Hawkins, uh, or Hawking's quote. And John Lennox, also from Oxford University, he has four master's degrees, a PhD in math, a doctor of philosophy and a DSC, which is given another doctorate given for uh, extremely valuable research. Okay, so he's uh, an authority. And then what Stephen Meyer said towards the end was a really important thing: that even when you try to say that the universe created itself from you know quantum physics and things like this, what you're saying is there has to be math. There have to be physical laws. So if they're saying there are physical laws, and that's what Stephen Hawking said, because there's a law such as gravity, okay, that even physical laws, okay, mathematical abstract concepts, that without time, without space, without matter, without energy for these physical laws to act on, they must exist in a mind. Abstract concepts can only exist if you can, you know, think about math. Math is abstract, right? It's an abstract concept. So if there is no place to write it down, okay, and it doesn't, it isn't acting on anything. You have, but you have physical laws. They have to ex be existing in a mind. That's the only place abstract concepts can exist. So even when they try to back out of this and say, "Oh, well, the universe created itself from nothing," they're saying that those physical laws had to be in existence. And how can physical laws, with you know, written in mathematical formulas, how can those exist outside of a mind? So um, that idea of information okay, being really critical, that the universe is founded on this, these abstract uh, physical laws and information and mathematics, okay, is something that the scientific community is coming to grips with more and more, okay, that information is really fundamental. Right? So even in evolutionary biology, the idea that, well, yeah, DNA is what creates, has the blueprints to create everything that you are, but it's the information in the DNA. Right? There are gigabytes of information, at least, okay? much of which we don't understand. But there's so much information in there. The blueprint for you and everything in, that is you is all in that DNA which is very small, very compact. Okay, so the information is foundational. So when we said at first there was the word, okay, that's a strange way to put it, right? So why, would he refer, why wouldn't he just say Jesus, right? Because we know he's referring to Jesus, but he says at first there was the word. Okay, but like in scripture, sometimes things allude to more than one reality. So... Um, that ha I think that kind of illuminates the idea that information is fundamental in the creation of, of the universe, okay, and these foundational theories. So, um, but do scientists understand the universe? Okay, so 
I forget who it was, and I couldn't find the quote. But it was somebody um, who was a very, who was like the, the head of a you know, scientific community, or I forget who it was, but I remember the quote was, we understand everything about the universe except dark matter and dark energy. That I thought that was a very funny quote. Okay, so it was very uh, arrogant statement, right? We understand everything about the universe except dark matter and dark energy. It was something that he said. And I thought, that's kind of a crazy thing to say. Um, there's, there's more that is not understood, but there's, there's quite a few things that I'll, I'll touch on very briefly uh, that, we, that scientists don't understand. So in the press, a lot of times, you get this idea that scientists have got this all figured out. Okay? They're just quibbling over the details. Right? That we, we have the model of the Big Bang, and we know how this all happened, and all these kinds of things. Um, but there's just, you know, there's some small details that need to be ironed out. That's the, if you read the popular press, that's the kind of impression you get about the state of science. Um, but that's not really true. Okay, so I want to go on to very quickly touch on a couple of these things. Okay, they're really fundamental. I mean, there's, this is, there's, not, there's a lot of things that scientists don't understand exactly, but these are a few things that are really fundamental. So, next. Okay, so go, go ahead to the next. Okay, so when he, the, the one scientist said, we understand everything about the universe except dark matter and dark energy. The reason I thought that was a strange thing to say is because this is what they say is the, the makeup of the universe. Okay, that dark matter is about 27%, dark energy is about 68%, okay, and all the other matter and energy that we know about is only 5%. Okay, so we understand everything about the, we understand that 5% is what he's saying. <laughs> the other 95%, we have no idea. <laughs> okay, is what, is what, how that sounded to me. <laughs> Okay, so it sounded kind of a crazy thing to say when he, he was asserting that, so, you know, uh, so that's why it sounded so arrogant to me, okay, because he was asserting it very, you know, assertively, I guess. <laughs> you know, we understand, we understand, you know, things really well. Okay, just a couple little things that we haven't quite figured out yet that make up 95% of the, you know, what we believe the universe is. So just pff, a couple, you know, we'll get this sorted out in no time. Okay, so the next one, uh, do you... Anybody, has anybody heard about the, the James Webb Space Telescope? Okay. Uh, it's been something I've been following for a long time. It's been, it took decades to get the funding for this and to build this thing and to send it out. And I watched it live when it was being launched into space. Uh, it was Christmas Day, 2021. So luckily for us, it was the day after Christmas here. So I didn't have to interrupt our festivities to watch it. But, um, when they launched this into space, and it took months to get out to the place a million miles away from Earth, where it's located. So this is the, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. So most people have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's an amazing accomplishment, okay, but the Hubble is still near Earth, okay? It's not too far away. The space shuttle was able to put it there. It was as far as the space shuttle could go, but it was the space shuttle put it out there, and it was able to go back and fix it a couple times. So, um, but this thing is a million miles away from Earth, okay? Nowhere close. And it was meant to see back in time. So I, I don't want to get into the physics of that, but, but the basic idea is that this thing can actually see back in time close to the beginning of where the Big Bang is. Okay, just a couple hundred thousand years after the Big Bang is what they're saying. But it can see back in time. Okay, because the further away you look, the, f the further back in time you're seeing, basically. And what they were expecting to see when this thing went online in the summer of 2022 was baby pictures of galaxies, right? Because this is very close after the Big Bang. Not very long had passed. They were expecting to see baby pictures of galaxies. And that's not what they saw. When the first pictures started coming back, and this is just the summer of 2022, not very long ago, and I was following this in the press, 
and astrophysicists were suddenly questioning their whole life. <laughs> they were having an existential crisis. Because what they saw, uh, this headline here says, the James Webb Space Telescope discovers enormous distant galaxies that should not exist. And it says, uh, giant mature galaxies seem to have filled the universe shortly after the Big Bang, and astronomers are puzzled. So puzzled is really minimizing <laughs> the way they were feeling. I was reading blogs from astrophysicists going, have I wasted my whole life? <laughs> you know, I mean, real existential crisis kind of stuff. They were completely freaking out. Because the model of the universe, as they understand it, is the Big Bang happens in that picture, and then the Big Bang, there's nothing but energy, and then stuff starts to form, and then you get small baby galaxies, and they become bigger galaxies later on. And now we're going to see these baby pictures of small you know, baby galaxies. And when they got the pictures, they're full, mature, grown-up galaxies, is what they're seeing. And they're going, that's impossible. Those shouldn't exist. <laughs> OK? So the whole, the whole under, our whole understanding of the universe is wrong, basically. You know, we don't get it. We, our theories are wrong. Like, we don't understand how this works. OK, so um, yeah, so that, that was, it's a, it was a fun thing to follow in the news <laughs> as I was reading articles about this that kind of, you know, well, this was, this was an interesting thing, <laughs> OK, because there were people really freaking out. Okay, that uh, we don't understand how this works. Okay, so the next, uh, a couple of the major problems about the universe. Okay, uh, I'll explain this very briefly. This is called the Hubble tension. It's referred to as the Hubble tension. So the Hubble constant, there, there are two ways of measuring what's called the Hubble constant, H0 there. <laughs> And the Hubble constant, it basically um, affects how fast the universe is going to grow and so how old the universe is. When they say, oh, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and that's based on the measurement of the Hubble constant. But there are two different ways of getting the measurement of that. And when they use two different ways of measuring it, they get different answers every time. Okay, and in the beginning, that was a little bit suggestive. They were like, well, you know, because they, they couldn't measure them very accurately in the beginning. That's what this is showing. Okay, the measurement, you know, it's plus or minus, okay, by a, a lot. So there was some overlap. But the more they've, they've honed this down and they've gotten better and better measurements, they realize the two different ways of measuring this constant come out with mutually exclusive answers that they, they're, they're very confident about each measurement and they don't match. So this is a very fundamental thing about the universe and how it's expanded and how old it is. And what they're saying is that our understanding of how that happened or how all, you know, all of that, there's something wrong with our understanding. Okay, that we're missing, we're missing something important here. Okay, is what this is saying. When you get data like this in science, it means your theory is not right. Okay, you've got new conflicting data like this, you need a new theory. It's time for a paradigm shift. Okay, so our understanding of, you know, the Big Bang Theory and all this um, is probably coming to the same place as the steady state theory where there's going to be a big rethinking, okay, of a lot of this. So that's the, the main point of this. We don't need to go into too much. So next. Okay, um, so this is one that's been around for a while, the idea of the horizon problem. And uh, the horizon problem is a big problem because the basic idea is that two things on either side of us, I'm not sure if I can explain this easily. Uh, let's see, well, you know that the speed of light is, this, is like the speed limit of the universe, right? Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Well, if you've got something that's, you know, 14 billion light years on that side of us and something that's 14 billion light years on that side of us, there's no way they should be able to talk. They, there's no communication possible, right? Because they're just too far away for there to have been any communication between them, except there's thermodynamic equilibrium between those. So basically what they're saying is things are too smooth. There hasn't been any way for them to even themselves out. 
Okay, it's impossible that they should be in thermodynamic equilibrium when they're so far away and they can't communicate. Okay, so that's a big problem. Okay, that's a big question that's never been answered. Okay, this idea of the horizon problem. Okay, that we're seeing thermodynamic equilibrium in different parts of the universe that are too far away to have come into thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so another big misunderstanding. Okay, next. Okay, and one I like to talk about a lot, okay, is the fine-tuned universe. And this is one of the things um, Christopher Hitchens, who's another very famous atheist who went around attacking Christianity a lot um, before he passed away. And he wrote a book, God is Not Great, and things like that. When someone asked him, what do you think is the Christian's best argument? Because he debated Christians a lot, like Frank Turek. Um, he debated Christians a lot about, you know, atheism versus Christianity. And, he asked, and someone asked him, what do you think is their best argument? And this is the one he pointed to. The idea that there are a lot of things that we know about the universe, physical constants, okay, that are just numbers, like big G in gravity is just a number, G, okay. And if that number were slightly different, the universe would not exist. I mean, changing it slightly means no stars, no nothing. Okay, so, I mean, not just us, or life would be different. Okay, life is impossible if you change any of these numbers just a teeny little bit. And what do I mean by a teeny little bit? Next slide. Okay, so some of these are so finely tuned that you're talking about one part in 10 to the 37th, 40th, 50th, 5th, 59th, 120th power. Okay, so that's... A ratio like that is like a fraction, right? So when you say, you know, one-eighth, if you cut a pizza into eight pieces, you take one. That's what one-eighth means, right? So think of cutting a pizza into 10 to the 120th pieces, <laughs> okay? So that's a 10 with 120 zeros after it. Okay, then choosing one of those. So that's the amount of deviation. If you change that number, by that much, okay, the universe doesn't exist. And there's a lot of them, okay, the whole page before was a whole bunch of different numbers that are all finely tuned. So um, that seems to show that our universe was designed, okay, that these numbers were chosen for us, okay, and we're running out of time. Next, okay, um, so some interesting things, so this is, I just took this out of Scientific American. Yeah, so Scientific American had this article up not too long ago. Is our universe a hologram? Physicists debate famous idea on its 25th anniversary. So physicists have been talking about maybe our universe is just a holographic projection <laughs> for 25 years. And the math makes sense that you can actually move between these different views and the math actually translates. So it's a helpful framework sometimes to solve problems that don't work out in this framework. You go over to this framework and you can do it. So, um, but maybe you haven't, you know, heard about that. Another one, this is also Scientific American um, in 2021. So, <laughs> the, the idea that we live in a simulation, okay, that the idea that we live in a simulation, that our whole universe is just a computer simulation, um, that some people will say, like, oh, there's some alien in his mother's basement who's, you know, created our whole universe on his computer. Okay, that idea. So, the idea that, you know, we live in a simulation is a, a, a widely talked about scientific theory that when they try to explain the fine tuning, how is the universe so finely tuned? Okay, this is one that comes up quite a lot. Okay, and he says confirmed, but it's an interest, he had an interesting take on it, but I won't get into it. Um, but one of the things I, when I, when I see this, it just strikes me. This is a creation theory, right? But it's the alien teenager in his mother's basement that, you know, created us on a simulation. That, that, that's fine, okay? But to talk about it being God, okay, that is beyond the pale. You can't say that, okay? Um, but it's an interesting thing. But one of the things I want to run through really quick is the, what's written in the, 
the handout is the parable of the crafty miner. Okay, so I tried to name it cleverly to, so you wouldn't, so the next part. Okay, what I mean is, you know, Minecraft. So my daughter Gabrielle was a big fan of Minecraft for a long time, so I kind of played it with her and, um, and I would do it in VR. So you strap on a VR headset and then it puts you first person right in the game so you can like hold your arms up and they look uh, like that. Okay, these blocks, next slide shows a first person view. Okay, that you're there and you can move your arms around and you can move around and you're there in that reality. Okay, and you can do scientific experiments. You can try things out and see, does this happen every time? So one of the things you can do in Minecraft is you can place a block of concrete right in the air, right in front of you, and it will stay there. And you can place another block of something else over here in the air, and it will stay there. Okay, and you can test this over and over again, it always happens, unless it's sand. If you put sand there, sand will drop. <laughs> okay, so if anybody's played Minecraft. So, um, but you can test all this out, okay, and you can try it all out, and you can say, aha, I have the laws of physics in Minecraft, okay, I can put things in the air, they stay in the air, you can even pile things on top of them and jump on top of them, they won't move. And you can understand how all this works. And you can say, these are the laws of you know, physics and what is possible and what is not. Okay, so if you said, you know, can you walk on water? Well, no. Okay, if you go out on the water, you sink. Okay, so you can swim, but the thing about Minecraft is it can be modded. You can modify it. So what are called mods in the, the community. So you can actually, because we are outside of that simulation, okay, we can modify things. We can change the code, right? So the next slide shows somebody created these boots <laughs> that allow you to walk on water. <laughs> okay, so that you can run around on top of the water with these Minecraft modded boots. And uh, somebody even got more clever than that. Over the next, there's a short video clip. It says, Staff of Moses. <laughs> he whacks the water and boom, parts the seas. <laughs> okay. So he can run around and, you know, uh, do that kind of thing. So this is an example that I've liked to use with students um, to help explain how miracles are possible, right? If information is fundamental to our universe, but we're in our universe, so we're like a player in Minecraft. If you're a player in Minecraft, there's things you can do, things you can't do, and they're all defined by the coder. The person who programmed that, that game defined what you can do, what you can't do, what are the laws of physics, what's going to happen, right? So because that's the way it is, and if you're just in there as a player, you don't have administrative <laughs> authority over that game, then you have to play by those rules. And every time you do something, it's gonna turn out the same way. Okay, you do this, you can test it, you can say, aha, here are the laws, now I understand, this is how things work here. Okay, um, but someone who has access to the code, who's outside of that realm, can adjust it. Okay, so um, obviously God is outside, so if we say information is fundamental, so there's a picture from the matrix, okay, and this is a little bit how physicists learn to see the world, right? After you do a bunch of simulations of um, parabolic motion and things like that, you start to see like or gravity is a vector pulling down on, you know, on an object as it's traveling and acceleration vectors and velocity vectors and these kind of things, you start seeing that you know, in real life, and it's a little bit like seeing into the matrix and seeing the, the information that's fundamental to the running of the universe, okay? But if you have, if you are the creator of this, okay, then obviously you have those administrative privileges to, to modify things and make things happen. So there's no contradiction to say that God can do impossible things. Okay, or that Jesus as God was able to do these things. So that was actually how I explained the incarnation in a, as an analogy 
Okay, the incarnation is an analogy to my daughter when she was big into Minecraft. It's like, you know, if you're the coder and you created Minecraft, okay, but then you slap on a VR headset and go in as a player, <laughs> okay, you're incarnated as a character inside the reality that you created. Okay, but obviously the creator can go in and say, oh, I'm going to create this little, you know, staff of Moses thing. I can go in and poof, I can, you know, do things that other players are not able to do. Okay, so it was a simple, a very, you know, simple and bl very blocky looking way <laughs> of explaining this in a way that's easy to grasp. Okay, and a lot of actually the um, intelligent design movement, the idea that what we see is best explained by an intelligent designer. That what we see in the universe and what we measure in physics and biology in these different areas is best explained by an intelligent designer, and that's a scientific theory that's been that's had good success. Um, a, a lot of computer scientists get that, okay? Because you know, when you sit, talk about DNA and you talk about randomly changing bits of DNA and and making improvements, they say, well, no, <laughs> okay. If I start randomly changing letters in my code, okay, that's not going to improve it like ever. Okay, the chances of that ever coming up with an improvement by just randomly changing letters in my code, uh, they, they get it right away. That's not, not going to work. Okay, so, um, and then the, next, the last slide is another quote. Okay, God authored all scientific laws. He is above them and is independent of them. God can override them at will, though normally he does not interfere with them. God is not limited by or confined to the universe. He created time, space, and all material in it. God is not a slave to scientific laws. He created them and is also the source of all life. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Hebrews 11.3. But this quote, well, actually, that was quoted along with this in President Kim's book. Again, so... <laughs> so. Uh, see the invisible change the world. Okay, so I wanted to kind of walk you through a little bit of how scientists, people with a scientific mindset that just rejects God, rejects miracles, rejects those kinds of things uh, automatically, how they can be made to understand and kind of look at this from a different framework and kind of and gain that understanding that President Kim got or that I got or that other physicists have to deal with when they they grapple with the Bible and how to have faith in these kind of uh, impossible things. Okay, so I will ask EPT to come up and I'll do a final prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you have created us, you have loved us, and we know that you are outside of time and space, that you are immaterial, you are spiritual that you have all authority over your creation, and that while miracles may seem impossible to us, they may seem things that are not of this world, are not natural, it's because they're not natural, they are supernatural. But that is not outside of your possibilities. You are not bound by time and space and energy and matter. You created all this, you do with it as you please. So we can have faith that Jesus was who he said he was. He proved it by doing impossible things that are only possible for the creator. We can believe in his death and resurrection. We can believe in the words that he said. That gives us more faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, should we all rise and end with a uh, last song of praise? Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness.